Welcome to church. Here at Hope, we're a multicultural family church in Varsity Lakes on the Gold Coast. No matter what you're facing right now, where you're from, or what language you speak, we want to welcome you. We're a home away from home for people all over the world and all walks of life. Our heart is to be the voice of hope in our community, a safe place for people to heal and experience their hope restored. So we're celebrating a Pentecost Sunday today. The Pentecost, the 50th day from the Passover, the seventh Sunday from the Easter. What are, what are we celebrating? The Pentecost. The purpose of the Pentecost was the God to give his believers the Holy Spirit. Yes. The power of the Holy Spirit so that we may become a witness of Jesus Christ wherever we go. Right. So today I want to look at the living by the Spirit's power. Living by the Spirit's power. That's actually New Living Translation. It talks about it in Galatians chapter 5. What's the point of a Christian living without the power of the Holy Spirit? Really. How are we going to be a witness of Jesus if we can't demonstrate the freedom and the victory we have over our life and what Jesus has purchased on the cross for us? Have you ever met really, really like a joyless person? I'm not talking about you, Justin. <laughs> you are pretty up there. <laughs> you are pretty always up there. It's like, Justin, shh, it's okay. Quiet. Right. No, I'm talking about like a, I'm not talking about the people who are just going through a difficult time and then um, being sad because of circumstance. I'm talking about people you've known for forever. As long as you've known them, they are so joyless or anxious, don't have any peace. Uh, but they love the Lord, they read the Bible, come to church every week, and still people don't see the changes of their life. And sometimes you wonder, uh, these are elements of the healings and, and then deliverance needs to happen, but every believer can have the power of the Holy Spirit if you want it. Yeah. Uh, it's only us that stops it. And if we have a real understanding of who we are in the Christ Jesus and what Jesus has purchased for us, the freedom. Freedom from slavery of sin and the consequence of the sin, we will be living and walking in the Spirit and living a life empowered by the Holy Spirit. So that's what I want to really talk about today. So the purpose of receiving the power of the Holy Spirit is actually not for me and my agendas. It was never about me feeling better about myself, but it was about the Jesus-centered. A purpose of us believers receiving the Holy Spirit is so that we will receive the power to be the witness of Jesus. Yeah. It's clearly said in the word of Jesus in Acts 1 and 8. So in other way, we cannot be an effective witness of Jesus if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. Simple. Uh, I have this habit of forgetting to charge my mobile phone. Oh, yeah, my husband says. So if you don't lead to me by the phone call or if you don't get a message back from me, please don't think I'm ignoring you. It's just my phone is often out of charge. It is, and I don't even realize, and I carry them in my handbag without being charged. And I often think the Christian living without the power of the Holy Spirit is like the mobile phone hasn't been charged. What's the point of carrying in your handbag? It doesn't ring. It doesn't send any message. Nobody can lead you by it. It's just like a little object that gives me extra weight to carry. So today, I want every one of us to go home receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. All of them were filled by the Holy Spirit on the day of the Pentecost. I, I had some people actually ask me a question. Um, I'm a believer. I read the Bible. I pray. I go to church. Isn't that enough? Isn't that enough? Why do I need the Holy Spirit? I have met um, many different people that has a different theology. So I have met the people saying, no, I don't need it. I don't need the power of the Holy Spirit. I have the Word. I don't need a miraculous power because this power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is talking about in the Bible here is actually miraculous power, dunamis power. It's not something we can create or manufacture ourselves. Is something has to come supernaturally from Jesus, right. from heaven. And then people say, no, I don't need it. I have a word. But if you have the word, you should know everything about the Jesus is supernatural. 
I had a people saying, I don't need the miracles. I don't need the supernatural. I have the word. But hang on. Isn't Jesus Christ raising from the dead? Is it supernatural? So don't tell me having a miraculous power given by the Holy Spirit is not needed today for our believers. Some argue, they say, we don't need the deliverance, we don't need these gifts of the Spirit. I, I know some doctrine would teach, depends on what denomination you are in. We are Pentecostal Church, by the way, if you haven't noticed yet. We, we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, we believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Just in case you haven't noticed yet. <laughs> okay. Just in case you haven't seen demon flee in, in this place, okay? And some are saying that you don't need it. It was replaced by the uh, discipleship and evangelism at the completion of Canaan uh, when, when the Bible was put together. Really? But Jesus hasn't returned yet. We are in between where the kingdom of God is here and yet. And why are we still here waiting for Jesus to come back? I don't know when, but I believe it's soon. We need to live our life empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit and do what the Jesus assigned us to do. To bring more people to his kingdom. Set the captives free. Preach the gospel. Preaching the gospel is not just a, a me and then Justin and then Pastor Rick standing here with a microphone. It's for every believer's responsibility. Okay? The preaching gospel is simple. I, I think sometimes the, uh, we in a church, in a very good intention, has complicated what the preaching is. I, um, I had a people tell me in the earlier days, you have an introduction. You have a key verse. One, two, three points, restoration, application, conclusion, closing prayer. Hang on, let me read that. Did Peter do that in the book of Acts? No, I don't read that. <laughs> Acts 29, he says. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> My goodness. You do that to me all the time. <laughs> Pastor Rick said, go and look up this and that. It doesn't exist in the Bible. <laughs> so seriously, preaching a gospel is not about your knowledge. It's not about how much theology you understand or you don't understand. It's about you and every believer going out there, telling other people what Jesus has done for you. Tell them your story, how your life has changed, how you were transformed, how you were healed. How your family were restored. How God freed you from all the stress and anxiety. And he gave you this supernatural peace that you cannot make sense of it. That's testimony. Go and tell people about the Jesus. That's what the preaching is. So, so we are all called to share gospel. I actually hate the, how the, the, uh, we in the good intention created this a platform ministry culture. Because that's not in the Bible. Every one of us are supposed to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, going out every day. Um, if you bump into me at the coffee shop, ask me about the Jesus, I'll be saying exactly the same thing I'm saying here, in exactly the same tension. <laughs> Who, someone called me that I'm already intense. I'm not that intense. <laughs> okay? I'm not intense. I'm passionate. <laughs> okay? So there will be no different, and it shouldn't be different to where you are in a prayer meeting or you're on the platform or you're in a, your connect group or you're at the work. I think one of the saddest things in the modern world is that Christians are in a hiding, and not by persecution, but by choice. Okay, this has nothing to do with my notes, so I don't know where I'm going right now. <laughs> but seriously, sorry, I've been in, in a prayer meeting for six hours. This is what happens. <laughs> Maisie, amazing to have you back. Yeah, <laughs> we missed you. We missed you. This is a resort of prayer. For thank you for everyone praying. She's a walking miracle. Yeah. It is a beautiful. Okay, so the purpose of having a Holy Spirit empower your life is so that you can live your life Jesus-centered. Who wants to live a life Jesus-centered? Right. Not me-centered. Okay, it's not about you. It's not about you being happy. It's about you accomplishing what God created you to be and to do here on earth. There's a reason and purpose for your existence. So the purpose of the Pentecost is to fill believers with the power of the Holy Spirit. 
so that we can testify for Jesus. As we say, preaching is the same thing. It's about the telling of Jesus. And how we live our life also testify to the people around us. We cannot convince people how much God loves them if what coming out of our mouth is a negative words and hatred towards other people. People are listening, people are watching how we conduct ourselves, how we live our life, more than what we say with our mouth. How do we trust people? Not just by words, by actions. So we can't just try to convince people, Jesus loves you, God loves you, God changed my life, and my, my heart is so full of my, my love, love of Savior, but I hate my brother. He's like this, and he's this. And who wants to sit down and, and then say, I'll have what you're having? You know, so we've we got to really look into ourselves, the why is it coming out in our life, because we're not living a Jesus-centered life. And I know I'm going to offend somebody today, because... And I'm, I'm prepared for it. So the, to be a Christian is to be a Christ follower. Yeah. Simple. That's right. Very simple. In Acts 11, 26, it is a record of the uh, Christians being a first called Christian in Antioch, mm. in a Gentile church. Why were they called Christians? Because it was evident to those around them how they lived their life, followed the teaching of Jesus. They didn't call themselves that this is who I am, it was actually people around them identified. And it was a gentle church. So this is how we are to live our life. And I know it's a challenge for all of us. I certainly have a mustard. There's so many things that God needs to clean out. It's almost like a repenting and repenting and repenting. Yeah, but we do need to seek Christ's center life. It starts with us having a desire. We can't be in uh, two different camps, you know, saying, I have a little bit of Jesus here, but I'll have a little bit of this over here. That's, that's not how we were meant to live our life. And the Holy Spirit will guide us, will guide us in every step, in every decision we make, because God knows from beginning to the end. God created you. God has a purpose for you. He knows from beginning to the end. You know, the Bible tells us, the Holy Spirit teaches us, guides us, aids us. It will come alongside of us, a paracleto. It's like a paramedic coming to aid when we are not able to um, physically maybe um, treat ourselves. And the Holy Spirit come along also to testify that the aid also the word in the Greek word also means that, that when you are in a court, you have your support, to someone who come and speak on your behalf. That's also the same word used here. So we need a Holy Spirit to guide us, teach us, rebuke us, correct us, so that we may live our life pleasing according to the God's plan. Having a Holy Spirit in your life, it's like having a GPS when you're driving. I don't do a lot of driving these days. My husband drives me around everywhere. But just like this week, I was driving to see someone, and I was so confident I can get there without GPS. I was so confident without my husband. I, I, last time I went there the, the, that way, that my husband was driving. So I thought, no, I remember him going this way. Um, so somehow I ended up driving into bushland that I didn't even know it existed on the Gold Coast. I do not remember taking a wrong turn. I do not remember turning like right or left. Somehow, I just followed the path and I thought it was the right way. And then I was singing, so I'm, I'm allowed to worship lead myself in my car. So I was singing <laughs> and then I kind of go, hang on, there's nothing here. There's no house, just a fence and a bushland. So I put the car on the side and I thought, okay, I better put the GPS on. Uh, and my Google map told me that I need to turn around, go back 3K. Wow. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Jesus. I had a power on my mobile phone that day. <laughs> because I often don't. <laughs> and I couldn't have called anyone. See? So I turned around, went back for about 3K. And I realized I actually did take a wrong turn. Yeah. 
I realized when I saw the sign, I wasn't paying much attention. My husband says that all the time, that when I'm walking, I don't pay attention where I'm going. I bump into the people, but I think the people bump into me. So, <laughs> so it happened again. So I, I was actually thinking, I said, God, I thought I knew where I was going. And then the Holy Spirit just whispered me. He said, sometimes you are overconfident. Sometimes you are overconfident thinking you know where you're going without inquiring of me. And I thought, yes, Lord, that's so true. And we can be like that in our life. You know, we don't know when we take a wrong turn. We don't know where we're going ahead of the wrong pathway for 3K until something starts looking, okay, this is not good. This does not look like where I want to go. And what do we need to do? We need to turn the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us, guiding us from the Word of God so we can make a turnaround, we can go back to the right path, and we can lead to destination in our life where the God wants us to be. Yes. I cannot stress enough to open the Bible. Yes. Open the Bible. <laughs> Please open the Bible. If you don't remember anything from today, just remember one thing. Please open the Bible. Yeah. Before you call Pastor Rick to pray for you, open the Bible. Yeah. It's true, okay? You have access to the sound room directly. Yeah, Every believer can go to yeah. God the Creator, yeah. Creator of the universe, yeah. in the prayer and hearing His voice, in the prayer and also the opening of the Word. But you would not know if it's the Holy Spirit talking to you or something else speaking to you, if you're not opening the Bible. So before you send those panic text messages to your Connect Group leaders, God bless all our Connect Group leaders. Thank you so much for the love and care. Before you do that, open the Bible. Open the Bible and then hear God speaks to you yourself. How do we know it's the voice of the Holy Spirit when you get guided by the Holy Spirit? It's like a, you think about it like a counterfeit money. How do we know the money is fake? By checking real thing. Thank you, Elisa. Yes, by checking a real thing. If you don't know the real thing, you don't know what is fake. And often people say the discernment is knowing all these evil things and demonic spirits and spiritual attacks, and say, no, disarmament is actually knowing what is real. And because we know what is real, you also know what is fake. So if we don't know what the Word of God says yourself, how do you know what I'm preaching right now is a real thing? You're not going to just trust me because I'm standing with a microphone. I hope not. I hope you will check every word I preach with the word of God yourself. And every person bring in a word, whether it's a YouTube or podcast or whatever it might be, I hope every one of us be able to filter by the word of God and the truth of the word of God yourself. I, I don't want to have a, a church filled with the people just believing whatever I say. I like us all to open the Bible. You know, one of my favorite quotes of the Charles Spurgeon, I was talking to a Bible college student last week on the discernment. Discernment is not about knowing right and wrong. If it's about the right and wrong, it's so easy, isn't it? It's like a black and white. But discernment is about knowing what is right and almost right. That's a trick. There are so many things out there Sounds like a voice of the Holy Spirit guiding us. Sounds like a voice of the God speaking to us. Some people will even use a scripture. But can I remind you? The devil knows a scripture. If you're not studying the word yourself, how do you know what is a real thing? That's a reason why we need the Holy Spirit in our life guiding. So the Holy Spirit will teach us, lead us. He is a spirit of truth to lead us to the truth and help us understand what is written here. I'm all for coming to the Bible College. Our Bible College is having a revival, being amazing. Yes, we are amazing. (laughs) 
So here in Acts 1, Jesus said to the believers in Acts 1, 4 to 8, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with the water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive a power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So when the day of the Pentecost came, they were all together in the upper room. Yes. What were they doing? Praying, yeah. waiting. Yeah. I absolutely love to ask. Thank you so much for those who came out at 9.30. We are starting a prayer at 9.30. We're going to pray as a church every week as well as Tuesday night. We're going to dig the wells of revival. So we had a two groups gathering, praying, repenting, interceding for God's church. The prayer is not a specialized ministry, like I said before. Can I encourage you? You don't just come to church and pray. Just like these believers who were waiting on the Holy Spirit to come on the day of the Pentecost in the upper room, they were not just doing for just that day. They were meeting regularly, every day, Bible says, praying and waiting on the Lord. You know, praying together with other believers is a normal thing. It should be a normal thing. I know some people might say, oh, pray is not my thing. Well, it better be your thing if you're a believer. Because in the book of Acts 2, it talks about they were breaking up the bread together, teaching of the apostle, and praying together. It's a key to the Christian living, the empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're meeting up with the friends of coffee. That's not just to finish with the coffee. Pray with them. Pray together. Don't waste your time gossiping, criticizing, complaining about whatever. Don't waste your time because the Lord is coming back. We really need to get the urgency in our spirit that he is coming back. We don't have a time to waste. The parents praying for children at home, that's got to be a normal thing. It's, let's not outsource our prayer. You yeah. know some company outsource those uh, telemarketers and calls? It's really weird, isn't it, getting those calls? I know my husband said to not do the impression. Because I, I, I was talking about it last night at dinner table and I got in trouble for it. Um, but seriously, outsourcing, you know what I'm talking about. When an A phone company calls. <laughs> And they kind of don't sound like someone from Australia. Okay, I'm not going to go there because my kids are losing it. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. But let's do not outsource your prayer life. Okay? Go to the throne room yourself. Pray to God yourself. And then come to your wise counsel. Then come to other believers to stand in prayer with you. But if you're not opening a Bible, if you're not praying yourself, don't ask other people to pray for your family, your children, your parents, your loved one. You've got to pray for them. Because if you're not, who else is going to pray like you do? Praying is not about us coming in an altar. It's not about that. It's an every day, every minute of thing. Like we're breathing in our ears. Same things. There was no specialized ministry, remember? There was no such a thing as a prayer ministry in the early churches. It was a way of living. Yeah. I would love every one of us to have that in our life. Yeah. You know, I love coming to the prayer meeting, don't get me wrong. Tuesday night prayer has been amazing. And a Sunday morning, it's, it's just something about corporately praying. Yes. But every one of us needs to be praying and hearing from the Holy Spirit ourselves. Yeah. So as a result of the Holy Spirit giving to the believers on the day of the Pentecost. The example of someone being empowered to be witness of Jesus is a Peter. The Peter was a liar. He lied. He denied the Christ. He, he told people he didn't know Jesus. He denied three times. Peter had a hot temper. 
all sorts of issues. But when he was filled by the Holy Spirit, the scripture tells us he got up in the front of people and addressed the crowd and told them what Jesus has done. And says 3,000 were added in one day. You might say, well, that, but that's apostle you're talking about in the Bible. No, he was an ordinary man. The Bible tells us he, he was an ordinary fisherman. And Jesus called him out. Jesus can call you out today. And if you hear your voice, it's your choice. You will follow or stay where you are. You know, sometimes we get uh, really timid. The timidity and then uh, fear of stepping out. Uh, Fiona touched on that last week. It, it's, it's coming from a fear. Fear of failure, fear of making ourselves full, fear of rejection, whatever it might be. But as long as we're allowing that to, to control us, we are giving in to fear over what God has to say about you. And that is a very me-focused thing. I'm so worried about what other people's going to think of me. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to close my mouth. I'm so worried about making a mistake. I'm never going to um, say anything or pray out in prayer meeting. I'm never going to say yes to Jesus. Uh, I'll let the other people do it. That's not a humility. That's a false humility. Right? That's a false humility. We are so worried about me and me getting hurt. We're letting those of fear to control our lives. That's not what the, the reason of the Pentecost is. The Holy Spirit came to empower you so that you may speak who Jesus is and what he has done. Absolutely. It is a time really. Um, I think enemies have been silenced way too many Christians in church. And us allowing it, us allowing by overthinking, being so fearful about whatever. If I thought about what people think of me, I certainly would have been getting up here today. Can you imagine if our worship leaders, who has done an amazing job today, by the way, <laughs> would say, oh, I, I don't want people to think about it of me, so I'm never going to sing. What's going to happen? Nothing will happen. Exactly. So we need to really live a life empowered by the Holy Spirit so you may accomplish mission that God has given to you. And it, it, there's a reason why you are here living right now in this hour. There's a purpose that God has purpose for you, each and every one of us. It is a something only has to be you in a way that God has positioned you in this hour. There might be a people who are needing to know love of Jesus. And you might be the only Christian in your environment. You might be the only Christian in the group of friends there. Or at your workplace, at your school, whatever it might be. At the supermarket in that very hour. You just don't know. So we need to be ready to move by the Holy Spirit. So there's another way of being a witness, which is living a life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not just what we say, but in the actions. And he talks about in the Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. In the New Living Translation, he talks about, well, it's a bit small, isn't it? Living by the Spirit's power. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? Yeah. So let's read it. It's a, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. In some translations, said walk in the Spirit. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the Lord of Moses. When you follow the desire of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful prejudice, adultery, sorcery, or in some translations, said witchcraft. It, it, con, uh, it also the, um, the uh, sorcery and witchcraft includes controls and manipulation. Okay, hostility, quarrelling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, 
selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of a fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against this thing. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. So this letter was written to a believers. Paul didn't write this to non-believers. It was written to believers. Why? Because the Galatians church who started off their journey good um, in his word, he said, bewitched, <laughs> being took aside whatever happened in their life, and they start living their life as if they don't know Jesus. Their life was marked by all of those sins. And uh, this is the, uh, a big contrast in when we really know the freedom we have in a Christ. The freedom, when it's talk about the Galatians 5 1, also talk about for the freedom that Christ died for us. Yeah. For your freedom, yeah. Jesus cried for you. The freedom that in the Galatians 5 1 is talking about, it's not the entitlement. Freedom is not an entitlement. Freedom is not the right for me and my purpose. Freedom here in the biblical definition is the freedom from a slavery. Those things there, all the evil, those things are what keep us in a chain. Christ already won a victory for us. The power of the Holy Spirit gives us ability to walk away from all these things. If you really know the freedom you have, you don't have to actually ask for freedom. Because it's already been given to you. We just need to know, truly know, the victory Jesus has won for you is a freedom from a sin. And it says in verse 22, the Holy Spirit produces. I can't produce it. I cannot produce love, patience, self-control by doing more or trying harder. Uh, if we just focus on that, we as a church, it's only going to do behavior management. I'm not interested in behavior management. I'm interested in transformation. The power of the Holy Spirit transforms us to walk away from all these things that keep us in the bondage and produces the fruit of Spirit for all to see so that we may testify for Jesus, His love. That love is not the warm, fuzzy things. It's actually talking about the sacrificial love of Jesus. That he lay himself down and died for us. That's the kind of love he's talking about. Yes, Patience. That's a big one. Joy. This joy is actually not a circumstantial joy. This is a talking about the joy come from knowing the salvation we have in Jesus. And who we are in Jesus. Not because everything's going great in our life. Uh, we have a really joyful um, Bible college trainers on Monday. External trainer. Um, we can hear joyful sound from upstairs when he comes in and singing. I think the other day Jasmine bring, and, and Tola came down to, to record it. Because they could hear from upstairs. You know the one of those Christians who just carry this contagious joy? Yeah. It spread. It doesn't matter what they're going through. They know this joy of the salvation. That's the joy that he's talking about in here. Peace. That peace is, again, it's not about something we can create or something we can uh, obtain by going, mm. no, it's not. It's a peace knowing that God is in control. Yeah, peace knowing that my God is bigger than my circumstance. My God is so much bigger than my emotions. That's a kind of peace. And a patience when we have to put up with others that is very difficult. I'm very grateful for people around me to put up with me and tell me stop. 
Kindness. Again, that's a loving kindness. The kindness of the Lord leads to salvation. Can we be that expression of his kindness? Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Don't we want to be marked by those things? But the things are, it's clearly said in the scripture, we can't do it ourselves. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our life to be able to produce those fruit of spirit. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask a few people to come and share what happened to them when they received the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so we had a, a few people came forward to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit for the first time last week. There's quite a number of, of people here. And can I also say the, uh, why the Pentecostal churches put emphasis on speaking tongue? And I know not everybody is comfortable with it. That we believe is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But whether you are speaking in tongue, don't speak in tongue, please don't ever think one is more than the other. There is no such a thing in God's kingdom, you being less because you are yet to speak in tongue. Can we make that clear? But on a day of the Pentecost, when the mighty wind came, when the fire came, they were filled yes, they were. with a new tongue. They start speaking new tongues. And I remember when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, it was shock to me. Because I didn't believe in it. I got saved. I was in this Pentecostal church. And I heard a lot of people speaking tongue in the prayer room. And I thought they were all weird. I even said to a pastor, um, actually it was Pastor Jim, leading a prayer meeting at the time, said, I think you're making up because you sound funny. And I was told, go home. If, if you want to receive the gift of the Father, go home and pray every day and ask the Lord to give it to you. You know, you don't need to come in an altar to receive the tongue or baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can receive it anywhere. But it is one of the ways that we will stand in prayer with you for you to receive. So I went to home. I prayed every night, still skeptical. And then probably about day five, I had a dream. And in my dream, I was speaking tongue. I went back to pastor and said, I had a really weird dream. And I still don't believe it. I think it was just a dream, my subconscious so on that Sunday, he called me out for the prayer. I stood in this altar, this very altar. I think it was about there, actually. He didn't say a word. He just stood in front of me. And then I fell backwards on the floor. I remember looking at this ceiling and tongue started gushing out of me. I couldn't stop. Yeah. Because I experienced it myself, I know it's for real. Mm. I know there are different theological points on that. There are some denominations don't believe in it. But our church, we believe fully in the gifts of the Spirit, including right. speaking in the tongue. Right. So-